Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. It's really a pleasure to, to give a talk in this already uh, prestigious online seminar. And uh, as uh, Monica uh, said, uh, I'm happy if you ask questions. So you can just type in the chat. Uh, probably I'll not see it, but maybe one of the organizers can check. Uh, and then uh, it's, it's not an issue. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, a topic uh, that I think it's uh, it's really uh, exciting and interesting, which is the search for stationary solutions uh, of the Euler equations of hydrodynamics, which have compact support. So um, first, I'm going to introduce uh, very briefly and quickly uh, what the Euler equations are. So they describe, uh, so it's a system of partial differential equations that describes uh, the motion of a, of a fluid flow, which is incompressible and has no internal friction, no viscosity. And uh, I'll consider in Euclidean space, dimension two or three. And this is the system of equations. Uh, the second equation is just the incompressibility condition, the variance of u is equal to zero. And the first equation is essentially Newton's law that the force, which is given by the gradient of the pressure, the inner pressure of the fluid, is equal to the acceleration of the fluid particle. So the unknowns of this system are uh, these two functions, uh, u, which is uh, the velocity field of the fluid, uh, depends on space and time, so it's a time-dependent vector field uh, in Rn, and also an unknown of the problem of the system is, uh, is the hydrodynamic pressure, which is a scalar function. So in, in all this talk, I'm going to consider, I'm going to focus just on stationary solutions. It's of course the simplest uh, case of solutions of this system of equations, solutions that don't depend on time. So you don't have this first step here, this is zero. Uh, so it models a fluid flow in equilibrium. And then the equations that, uh, that you get are divergence of u equals zero and u gradient u equal to minus the gradient of p. There is uh, a second, totally equivalent formulation of these uh, equations in terms of some important quantity, I will use it later, which is called uh, the Bernoulli function. And uh, this system of equations is equivalent to, to the stationary equations here when this is, not, when this is zero. And it's that uh, the system is that the vector product of u and the curl of u is equal to the gradient of this Bernoulli function and the divergence of u is equal to zero. The Bernoulli function is defined uh, this way, just yes, the pressure plus one half of u squared. So directly, uh, I'm going to the problem uh, that we will uh, study here in this talk, we will consider. And it's a very, this very simple, apparently uh, naive question. So do there exist stationary solutions of these equations of no time dependence, stationary solutions with compact support or even a bit more uh, general with finite energy, finite L2 norm. And uh, okay, it could be solutions in a strong sense, in, in a sense of being regular enough, maybe smooth solutions, but you can ask the question also for, uh, for weak solutions in some sense that I will define later. So not necessarily smooth solutions. So this is the problem. It's apparently a naive uh, question, but uh, it turns out that it's, uh, it's a very hard question. Uh, in general, at least in R3, it's very hard, but in R2, it's, it's indeed very, very simple, the answer to this question. Uh, the problem is easy because in, in 2D, in, in R2, you have that uh, your, your divergence-free vector field U can be written in terms of a scalar function, which is called usually the stream function, a function of two variables, X and Y. So U is written as the, as the orthogonal gradient of Psi, this is simply like the, the, this is the symplectic gradient. And uh, the stationary Euler equations in this case take this form is that uh, the gradient of psi of this stream function and the gradient of nabla of psi, the Laplacian of this stream function, these two gradients are parallel. So the cross product is equal to zero. This is just the stationary Euler equation in dimension two, in R2. So it's then easy to construct compactly supported, even smooth solutions uh, to this equation, which are uh, defined, for example, by a radial function, 
a function that depends uh, here this x square means uh, this is x and y real variables so this is this should be x square plus y square so this is the radial variable the square and support it on the unit on the unit disk of the plane of the Euclidean plane so this is a, this is a smooth function that glues uh, smoothly with zero so indeed this function psi has a support which is uh, which is the unit disk on Euclidean plane and then uh, it's it's also a radial function of course and then you compute uh, this vector field and you get uh, a velocity field uh, whose streamlines are are circular and it's supported indeed on the on the unit disk so this gives you a compactly supported solution in in r2 it's actually uh, well you can glue of course several of these solutions this joint you you can get you can take this joint disk with different centers and then uh, take a sum of functions of this type you get uh, different solutions compactly supported with a support that is formed by by several disjoint disk it's open actually uh, and it's an interesting question uh, to know if the if the support in, in the sense of local support in its in its component in its connected component of the support uh, the the function uh, the function must be radial radially symmetric here it's radially symmetric but we don't know if you could have uh, compactly supported solutions say a smooth or at least of sufficient sufficient regularity whose support is like an ellipse or something like this not not completely circular okay but this but at least the problem of existence it's very simple in in dimension two okay in dimension three uh, the problem is is much more complicated as i said and actually the first uh, results in this direction were in the opposite direction so it's there were some negative results uh, so the first one it's is this uh, theorem by Jiu and Xin, 2009 so if you have uh, if you consider solutions uh, which are axisymmetric so this means solutions that uh, don't depend on the angle phi so this here i'm using standard cylindrical coordinates in r3 so don't depend on the angle and 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 furthermore you assume that they don't have swirl uh, swirl means without swirl means that there is no phi component usually if you have a vector field in cylindrical coordinates there should be a, a third component here which is in the direction phi but you assume that this this is zero then uh, uh, these uh, mathematicians proved that if you have solutions of this type uh, c1 that are compactly supported then the only solutions of this type are the the trivial ones the zero one so this is a negative result. There are not compactly supported solutions of this type with these assumptions. A second result, uh, which was proved uh, first by Nadia Schwila in 2014, and then later improved uh, and, and actually uh, generalized to not only to C1 solutions, but also weak solutions. It concerns uh, Beltrami fields. So Beltrami field, so the theorem, uh, or well, a particular case, because as I said, it's a bit more general. You don't need so much regularity actually is that if you have a vector, a vector field a, gen, a generalized Beltrami field which is a vector field that satisfies that the curl of u and u are proportional so the vector product is zero proportional vector fields the variance of u is zero in compressible field then uh, if you assume that it has finite energy finite l2 norm the, the only solutions to this system is u identically zero so there are no uh, solutions of this type that actually turn out to be stationary solutions of the other equation. This is a particular case. Let me go back to show you why. Uh, in this formulation of the Euler equation, I'm considering solutions such that the Bernoulli, value, the Bernoulli function is constant. This term is not here. So this is a particular, this equal to zero is a particular case of these stationary solutions. And uh, the theorem says that there cannot exist in particular, compactly supported solutions. But uh, so, okay, so this suggests uh, the conjecture that several people believed for some time, and actually I tried for, for some time to prove it, uh, that there don't exist at least a smooth or a smooth enough stationary solutions of the older equations with compact support, general stationary solutions, not only of these types. So the surprise, the surprise came. Uh, a couple of years ago when 
Alexei Gavrilov uh, constructed uh, a compactly supported solution of the Euler equation, which is actually smooth, C infinity, and which has the, the following properties. So it's, it's the simplest in the following sense, the simplest that it can be in the following sense. It is axisymmetric. So written in terms of cylindrical coordinates, it doesn't depend on the angle phi. It, it has swir. I mean, it has a phi component because without phi component, we know this cannot exist, but it has phi component. And, uh, and then the, this, this solution, it has some peculiarities. One is that uh, it's supported uh, in, in toroidal domains in a, in a tube, which is actually, it's, it's, a, it's a small neighborhood of a circle. So, so you have a standard circle of cost and radius on the on the set equal zero plane, and then uh, these solutions are supported. They, they, they don't have a, a support that is very fat. I'd say this roughly speaking. It's the, the support is uh, is uh, is a very small neighborhood of a circle, a thin tube, and actually the the cross section of this tube is not is not circular, close to be circular in some sense, but it's not circular. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a third uh, important uh, property. This is actually key, uh, which is uh, rather unusual for a stationary solutions of the other equations, is that the pressure, uh, the pressure function is constant along the streamlines of the fluid. So when you consider, when you take the, the scalar product of U and the gradient of P, it's zero. So, uh, so the, the streamlines, the, the integral curves of the velocity field of the, of the fluid flow lie on the level sets of the pressure function. This is, this is something that this solution satisfies, this condition. And I, actually, it's a family of solutions, not only one. Um, so it depends on a parameter, R, real parameter, positive. So it's, it's a family of solutions of this form. So you have UR and PR. These are certain concrete functions, concrete field here and concrete scalar function here. Uh, that solve actually the stationary Euler equation. And uh, you have the freedom of, uh, well, the parameter here R, and then the freedom of uh, function G, any function, arbitrary function of one variable that is compactly supported to get, uh, to get compactly supported solutions. So U is of this form is proportional to U uh, via this G, and P is the primitive of this G squared. So with this, you get uh, these solutions. And as I said, uh, this couple of functions, uh, which is the, the, the core of Gavrilo's work is to prove the existence of these functions, UR and PR, of this vector field UR and this function PR. They solve the stationary equation in a thin tube. So in a, in a small neighborhood, narrow neighborhood of, uh, of a circle and, uh, and also satisfy this uh, this very strange and curious condition that the pressure is constant along the streamlines of u. So u r dot gradient of pr is equal to zero. They are not explicit functions. They can be computed uh, somehow. The, the, the Taylor expansion, at least at some point, can be computed um, algorithmically, say. But um, so, so they satisfy a certain system of, of PDEs and ODEs, etc. Uh, but the, the existence is, is actually it's a difficult it's a difficult proof. Uh, and, and the method is here here I wrote this rather obscure obscure method uh, because um, although you can follow if, if you study the paper in detail you can follow it uh, and it's uh, you can repeat the computations everything is right and it's perfect really clever actually really clever. But you don't really, at the end of the day, you are convinced that the proof is right, that they have constructed, uh, that Gavrilov has constructed what he claims, but you don't really understand why it worked or what's the reason, say geometric, analytic, some reason, deeper reason of why this works, okay? So, um, but actually a key of all of this to get the, the compactness is this localizability which means that uh, it means this condition and means that the, that the pressure, that the level sets of the pressure are compact. So somehow you are able to localize because you, you find solutions to the Euler equation with a pressure 
that has compact level sets, in this case, toroidal level sets, and U lies on the on these level sets. The streamlines are, are tangent to this. And that this is why you achieve the, the compactness of the support, okay? Then uh, a bit later, uh, these, these solutions were put in a broader context and, in, and they were constructed in a more systematic way by Constantin La and Bicol using uh, what is called the, the, the grad Chavrano formulation for axisymmetric stationary solutions of the other equations. I'm going to review this uh, now in, in a moment. And, uh, and actually this, is, this, this work is much easier to understand and to, and to follow than, than Gabrilo. And, it's, and it applies to the more general setting of, of equations. So uh, this leads to the, to the following questions, problems. So the first one is, uh, are there more solutions beyond this Gabrilo? Because as I said, this Gabrilo family, you have this freedom of this one parameter and you have this freedom of this function G, but it's not so huge. There are not so many. It's, uh, it's more or less controlled, this family, and, and it happens something similar to Constantin La and Vico solutions. So uh, a second condition is uh, this, this localizability con condition, this pressure being, the gradient of the pressure being orthogonal to the vector field U, uh, is this a necessary condition or are there compact, uh, compactly supported solutions without this property? And uh, last question is if there are solutions compactly supported that are not axisymmetric or even uh, of arbitrary topology supported on tori in a space that are embedded in complicated ways. So this uh, very remarkable works of Gabrilov and Konstantin Lam Vico leads to all these problems which are wide open uh, today. So it's, uh, that's why I said, I think it's a very exciting and challenging uh, area of, of research. So um, what I want to, to tell you uh, today is, um, is a different approach to, to Gabrilov approach. Uh, which is based uh, on overdetermined boundary problems. With this approach, uh, yes, uh, a spoiler is that uh, you will get a family, a much bigger family of solutions that are compactly supported, uh, stationary solutions to the other equation, but you pay a price for this generality. And the price is that your solutions are not smooth. You will get only weak solutions, actually piecewise smooth solutions. So then I, I have to, to tell you, to introduce the, the notion of weak solution in this context. So here is the, the definition of weak solution of a stationary Euler. So we say a pair U and P, a velocity field and pressure of class say L2 log in R3 is weak solution of Euler equation of a stationary Euler. If, uh, if you have this, uh, this condition, this tensor product of U, U this, is the, this is the Jacobian, of W, W is any vector field compactly supported. This product here means, uh, so this is the matrix product of this and this, and then you take the trace. So for this is scalar, of course. Mm -hmm. and plus P divergence of W, this is equal to zero for all W compactly supported. And the divergence free condition, this is usual condition, uh, is that uh, U is orthogonal to the gradient of any compactly supported function, mm -hmm. smooth compactly supported function. So this is the notion of weak solution. And the, the very simple lemma that I want to exploit is the following. So, so I'm going to tell you with this lemma, uh, a simple recipe to construct uh, weak solutions uh, to stationary Euler with compact support. Um, piecewise smooth, but, uh, but still solutions. So the, the lemma says that if you have uh, a bounded domain, omega in R3, in the domain, you assume you have a V, a vector field V, that is solution to the stationary Euler equation in the domain. Okay, assume you have this with, with some pressure, P tilde. Okay, and uh, you assume that uh, the domain is invariant by the flow, which means that V is, is, is tangent to the boundary of the domain. And also, you assume that the pressure of this fluid is constant on the boundary of the domain. Let's assume these two things. Then it's very it, it's simple using this formulation to, to check that if you define a vector field uh, u in R3, um, which has this form, it's given by v in omega in the domain, the v that you started with, and zero outside. You just put a zero. 
and uh, the pressure uh, would be p tilde in the domain and the same constant uh, on the boundary outside. Then this, this, uh, this vector field, this capital UP, is a weak solution, uh, which is compactly supported, of course, because this is zero outside, a weak solution of the stationary Euler equation in R3. So, um, so here um, you, you, could, you can understand this assumption of the pressure being a constant on the boundary as a sort of localizability condition on shell. Remember this Gavrilov uh, property, this curious Gavrilov property that u is tangent to the level sets of, of p, right? Uh, the streamlines of u lie on the level sets of p. Here we don't demand that, which is too strong. We just say that, uh, that p is constant on the boundary and the boundary and, and the vector field is tangent on the boundary. So it's just a, a sort of uh, localizability, localizability condition on shell. So the question is, okay, we have this lemma. At this moment, the lemma is not very useful because uh, for this lemma to be useful, we need uh, a V and P tilde. We need a, we need a stationary solution of the Euler equation in omega that satisfies these conditions. And this is a sort of overdetermination because we are asking for solutions whose pressure is constant on the boundary and such that the, the, the vector field is tangent to the boundary. This is a sort of determination. So are there solutions? Are there domains uh, and solutions on this domain satisfying this condition? If so, do construct a weak solution of Euler. Okay, so to address, um, to address this problem, to construct solutions which are useful to use this lemma, we are going to focus just on uh, axisymmetric solutions. Why axisymmetric solutions? Because of this graz shafranov formulation that I'm going to review, you will be able to reduce uh, this problem to, uh, let's say, a standard, well, maybe not totally standard, but at least uh, an, an overdetermined problem for elliptic scalar, the elliptic PDE, uh, where you have some tools and some ideas that you can apply uh, to try to construct uh, these overdetermined solutions. So let's consider uh, in cylindrical coordinates stationary axisymmetric solutions. Any stationary axisymmetric solution has this form uh, in cylindrical coordinates. This psi here is, a, is, the, uh, is the cylindrical uh, stream function, only depends on the coordinates R and set. And this is a, a, a function f that depends on psi and it's free, any function f of psi. And, um, and the gratia Frano formulation tells you that uh, this ansatz field, uh, a vector field U of this form, satisfies the stationary Euler equation if C uh, satisfies this, that is called the gratia Frano equation, uh, which is the following is L psi, which is a second order operator, elliptic operator. It's, it's almost the Laplacian here in, in R set coordinates minus this first order term. Okay, you can write this uh, in this divergence form equal to this uh, nonlinear uh, zero order term here, uh, R square, H prime of psi, H is any function, any function minus one half F square uh, prime psi. And, uh, and the pressure of this, uh, this the velocity field, the pressure is given by this formula. And as I said, the functions F and H can be picked freely. And if you get solutions, if you get a function psi for some h and some f uh, to this equation, then uh, with this uh, recipe, uh, you get a stationary solution of Euler. So this leads, if you consider then um, this lemma, you go back, okay, let's consider just axisymmetric solutions and let's write down how this lemma or how these conditions, better to say, how these conditions look like in the uh, axisymmetric setting. So in the axisymmetric setting, we have the, the axisymmetric version of the lemma before, which is, uh, if, so if you have a, a bounded domain omega, uh, so this is contained in the, in the, in the closure of, uh, for positive radial coordinate or positive, then assume that there is a, a function psi, string function, that satisfies the graz shafranov equation in omega. This is a, an elliptic semilinear PD, so assume you have this size satisfying this for some H and F. 
and uh, with boundary conditions. Which boundary conditions? It's constant on the boundary, let's say zero, and uh, a, Neumann, a Neumann condition also on the boundary, which is for some positive constant, the, the normal derivative plus uh, the value of this function f square uh, at zero. f Remember, f appears um, in the problem, in the gratia fran of equation. Okay, over r square, so it's a Neumann condition that depends on the point on the boundary. It depends on the on the distance to the to the set axis. Then, if, if you have a solution to this overdetermination, to this overdetermined problem, then the vector field defined uh, as uh, before, with uh, uh, well inside omega defined uh, this way, outside omega defined as zero, and the pressure with the formula I told you, etc. This is a stationary solution of the Euler equation, weak solution, uh, which is actually would be uh, piecewise smooth. Mm -hmm. So this leads to uh, an overdetermined boundary problem for this uh, semilinear elliptic equation. Okay, so now we are ready to, to state uh, the, the theorem that we proved uh, in this setting. So it's a, it's a work, it's a joint work with Miguel Dominguez from the Universidad de Santiago de Compostela. Uh, my colleague uh, Alberto Enciso, also from the ICMAT. And uh, the result is the following. So this is just a sample uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a series of results that you can, that you can obtain. I mean, the, the non-linearities, this, uh, this function f and h that appear here, they can be very general. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not only the, the choice that I'm going to make here, but just because I, I want to tell you a bit about the proof. So I, I'm going to focus just on, on function f tilde that is zero, zero, and is negative to the derivative. And also h uh, prime at zero is zero. So consider functions smooth enough. So then the theorem says that, um, that there exist solutions uh, to this overdetermined problem. <clears throat> so for, for each sm small enough epsilon, and also they depend on a parameter r, positive r, which we assume to be large enough. There exist uh, non-trivial solutions of the form described uh, before, so axisymmetric, uh, solving this uh, this problem, this overdetermined problem, etc. For uh, suitable uh, planar domains that depend on r and epsilon, and these functions are uh, are smooth are smooth enough. They are of class C S plus one up to the boundary. The domains where these solutions exist, this is. This, uh, this reminds you of uh, Gavrilov, actually, because uh, we, we construct solutions in, in a small deformations of disk of radius epsilon. So the, the, the support of our weak solutions is actually, it has a small volume, it's, it's a small. Um, and center at, at, a, at some point R0 of the R set plane. And uh, the functions that define the solution this function f that appears in Gratia Frano for formulation is of this form, the f tilde that you fix before, and then some constant fr that will that is explicit actually, epsilon square. And, uh, and actually you have some properties uh, of positivity, etc. But I want to focus on some, on some aspects of this statement. So this large enough r actually it's, uh, it's computable. I mean, large enough means uh, larger than certain constant. That depends on the derivative of f tilde and h. If tilde and h were given from the very beginning, were fixed from the very beginning. Also, the, the domain, uh, the boundary of the domain, it has this form. It's a circle of radius epsilon plus some epsilon q perturbation. A second property is that this, the, the constants are explicit, actually. The constant fr, the constant fr appears uh, here in the definition of f. Of the function f that appears in the in the Gratia Frano formulation, this is explicit, totally explicit. Oh, depends on these constants here, the derivative, the, the value of the parameter r, etc. And also the constant in the Neumann condition is is explicit up to epsilon cube. And uh, finally, also the function psi is um, well, you can compute actually uh, an epsilon expansion. So uh, at, fir at first order, it's, it's like it's a radial function uh, centered at, at the point uh, R0, R in the R variable and zero in the set variable uh, with this constant in front of the function. 
plus epsilon cube terms. So this is the this is the result uh, that we proved. I don't know if uh, if you have some questions or comments because if not, um, I'm going to um, I'm going to tell you a bit the last. 15 minutes, let's say, I'm going to, to show you a bit the, the proof of this, um, of this theorem. Mm -hmm. No? There are no questions in the chat. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Great. So, so let's see. Um, okay, so the idea. So what's the idea, the general idea, idea of the proof? So, um, so the rough idea, uh, we want to solve um, this overdetermined problem uh, for some, uh, for a, so th these are the overdetermined conditions. This is the equation. Okay, this L is not the Laplacian, but not very far from being the, the Laplacian with this nonlinear zero order term here. So, roughly speaking, uh, okay, the, the difficult part, of course, is the, um, is the Neumann condition. Without this, this is just a Dirichlet problem. This is simple hmm. existence of Dirichlet problem to this elliptic equation. Uh, but then, um, okay, let, let's assume that we, we try to construct solutions to this overdetermined problem that are small perturbations of, of a point, let's say a circle, which is degenerate. So if you degenerate your domain omega to become just one point, this normal condition, this is a constant because R, R depends on the point of the boundary. Now, now the boundary is just one point, this is a constant. So this leads to have a usual overdetermined uh, problem with constant, constant normal datum on the boundary and Dirichlet datum. So solutions to this are, uh, are circles, are disks, are disks. Actually, uh, this is a very a degenerate situation where we have collapsed uh, your domain to a point. Let's, let's blow up a bit the point. Now, the, now this is no longer a constant, it varies, but it does not change so much. It's almost constant. So it stands to reason that, to reason that probably there, there could exist solutions, uh, which means domains omega and solutions to this uh, overdetermined uh, problem, which are close to radial solutions in disk of very, very small radius. So this is just the idea, trying to, to, um, um, to work uh, with this, uh, with rod, with this rod, uh, uh, let's say, a guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, to, to do this, uh, I'm going to consider, so it's convenient to introduce variables, X and Y. So you have um, a rescaling because uh, we're going to, every, everything in the, in the original coordinates will be of, of size epsilon. So I'm going to rescale everything to become of size one. So we, do, we introduce this uh, for some point uh, capital R, these variables X and Y, okay. Useful polar coordinates in X and Y. So if you write the grad shafranov equation in these new variables, it reads uh, this way. The Laplacian, this is standard Laplacian in these X and Y uh, variables. And, uh, and, this, and this term here, first order, et cetera. And we want uh, solutions uh, in domains, which are perturbations of the circle, of, of circle of unit, uh, of unit radius, rho equal one, rho is the radius in these coordinates plus a small perturbation. This perturbation is a function of theta times epsilon. Okay. So, uh, and our solutions actually will be small. So uh, we rescale also the function psi. We, we introduce um, a variable phi, and then you lead an equation for phi, which is this one here, the Laplacian plus this first order term, which depends on epsilon. And here there is epsilon and this remainder uh, term uh, which is bounded by epsilon square. The uh, S minus one norm, CS minus one, is bounded by epsilon square. And this A and B are some constants that are that are fixed uh, from the data of your problem, the, the function H and the function F tilde. So you have this equation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have the Dirichlet condition. The Dirichlet condition is uh, psi equals zero on the boundary, which means that on the radius one plus epsilon B, for, all, for any angle theta, this is equal to C. So, uh, so now the first observation is that when, so formally when epsilon is zero, this is not here, 
this is not here, this is not here. So you get uh, the very simple equation that the Laplacian of phi is equal to a constant with, uh, with Dirichlet datum. So this has a solution, explicit solution, which is this radial function, okay, with this constant here. So now uh, the idea, which is very simple, uh, because this we are just solving now a, a Dirichlet problem, usual Dirichlet problem, is that when epsilon tends to zero, uh, the implicit function theorem in Banach spaces will allow, uh, allow us to, to prove uh, the following result, which is existing results, resolve solutions for a small enough epsilon and any function which is bounded, uh, there will exist uh, a unique solution, which is close to this radial solution that satisfies this equation and the Dirichlet boundary condition. And actually by the maximum principle, this will be negative. And you have some evenness properties if your, if your function B is, is even in this, in this sense. This is very standard because this is just a Dirichlet problem. So it's very easy to, to solve um, this equation. But what I want to emphasize with this is not, it's not uh, really the, the result that there exist solutions to a Dirichlet problem for this semilinear equation, which is standard. But, uh, but you can construct, but that you can, uh, and, and that's important, you can do, uh, you can write an, an asymptotic expansion of the solution when epsilon is small, and this will be important. So the asymptotic expansion, uh, is written, so I'm going to tell you now about the asymptotic expansion, is written in terms of the usual Poisson integral operator uh, of the domain, uh, which gives you, so it's, uh, so you have a function f, uh, which is a function, uh, uh, okay, so this is the Poisson integral operator of a domain omega epsilon b, so you have, a, you, you fix b, which is the, it gives you the perturbation of the boundary, so this is the only harmonic function in the domain that satisfies the condition, uh, the boundary condition F. Okay, this is the useful Poisson operator. So uh, using this notation, you can compute, you can compute the solution to the Dirichlet problem for this perturbation of the domain, one plus epsilon b, and the solution is of this form: is uh, is the radial function that I introduced before plus first order term, uh, which is this explicit function plus this Poisson uh, operator here applied to the function B. Okay, and this A1 and A0 are some constants that are important uh, in the construction. So now we have, um, so, so summarizing what we have is, uh, is a domain, the CP is, a, is a perturbation, small perturbation of, uh, of, a small, of a small disk of radius, well, in this, in this rescale coordinates is a disk of radius one. Okay, so we have small perturbations of this of radius one. For any perturbation, for any B, we have a solution to the Dirichlet problem. So we would like to, to say that at least for some choices, okay, for most of choices of your function B, of your domain, your solution, your Dirichlet solution will not satisfy an overdetermined Neumann condition, of course. But can it happen that for some choices, at least for, for, each, for each epsilon, there, there exists a B, a perturbation such that it satisfies the Neumann condition. Because we have a lot of freedom. We have the freedom of all the Bs, all the functions that are defined, uh, that are periodic functions uh, on, the, on the boundary, on the boundary of the disk. So for this, to, to see if this can be done, if, if this is feasible, we have to uh, understand how this uh, Dirichlet solution changes when we change the domain, when we change the function B. So for this, we introduce this notation, the, the derivative of the solution uh, with respect to the, to the boundary of the domain, uh, which, we, um, uh, which we denote uh, by this uh, bolt B, okay, which is a function defined on the, on the circle. So this is the boundary, this is the variation of your solution with respect to variations um, of the boundary. So then defining this operator in terms of real uh, components of your of a function f. So this applied to, to f to a function f. This is a, this gives you a function on the disk from functions on the on the boundary on the on the circle. Then what we prove is this is this proposition is is just a computation. It's a compu it's the computation of this first variation of this first variation 
on the at the point uh, b equals zero b b is the perturbation so uh, is the is the is the point uh, where you are perturbing so b equals zero means uh, the the disk of radius one okay so if you have the disk of radius one and you perturb with this uh, bolt b you have uh, this variation for the function so this is the first order again in terms of this operator uh, p that i introduced before the usual poisson integral operator okay and we need also the second order epsilon square in terms of this operator here and this operator here plus epsilon cube terms so now we are ready uh, to analyze the, the neumann condition so uh, to analyze the neumann condition uh, we just have to realize that if you define this uh, this operator which uh, so which acts with it takes uh, an epsilon and it takes uh, a function b on the boundary which will encode the perturbation of the boundary it's simply given by the gradient square of the Dirichlet solution minus uh, some constant uh, that i'm going to tell you now what constant this is plus this uh, this function this explicit function then uh, the first observation is that the neumann condition that we want to solve uh, holds with a constant which is epsilon squared this constant if and only if this uh, this this operator here is equal to minus fr fr is is the constant that i introduced before it's a it's a explicit constant that depends on on r and the and the data of the problem okay so we want to to find solutions to this uh, to this problem to this equation hmm. on the boundary this is on the boundary hmm. So uh, the constant, so to, to obtain solutions to this problem, the, the constant that we're going to choose is, uh, is this one is, uh, okay, it's given by, by this expression, but the, the idea is simply that we want a constant here so that this function here on the boundary is orthogonal to cosine, on, cosine of theta. This will be important for some invertibility properties of an operator that will appear later. That's why we need uh, uh, this uh, orthogonality l2 orthogonality to cosine of theta of this so then you take uh, l2 product of this with cosine theta cosine theta and from this you obtain the constant simply this okay and then uh, the important thing of this is that you can compute perturbatively in epsilon uh, all these objects here the the constant phi epsilon b is of this form a certain explicit constant plus o epsilon this uh, this uh, operator here is, is is some constant plus order epsilon etc you, you can you can give uh, an explicit expression up to some order of these quantities okay so um, so then we want to we want to analyze uh, we want to solve uh, this equation to, so to to solve this it's uh, we, we introduce the operator this operator uh, g g epsilon b which is essentially like the, the derivative at, at epsilon equals zero of this function f we, we subtract here kappa because f uh, epsilon b the first order is kappa so this is a further epsilon the first uh, the, the first variation in epsilon mm -hmm. so uh, you, you get by continuity that this is well defined this operator and then you can introduce uh, spaces uh, on the circle, which is which is essentially uh, the set of functions which are even uh, in the angle and are, and are l two orthogonal uh, to the cosine of theta, and um, okay the ball rate is one in this space. And the result, okay, well the, the point is that well from these observations it, it follows that this operator here. G defines uh, defines a map from uh, this set this space of, of functions times minus epsilon naught epsilon naught epsilon naught is small enough uh, to the space of, of functions uh, which are l two orthogonal uh, to the cosine of theta and the reason uh, for the image of this to be l two orthogonal is be because of this choice of the function of the constant c that makes this l orthogonal to cosine of theta. So with this, uh, you, can, uh, you can analyze the, the, derivative, the derivative of this operator, this operator g at the point 0, 0, at epsilon equals 0. And uh, 
variation and the boundary perturbation zero, which means perturbation that the boundary is uh, just the unit disk. Okay, so this uh, operator that can be analyzed and can be written explicitly, uh, actually, it turns out to be a bounded uh, operator, an invertible uh, linear operator, for some condition, uh, which is that this constant a r squared minus three b is different from zero, and this a and b these are constants that appear in the process uh, before. Mm -hmm. okay. So now this is uh, we are essentially done because. Uh, we take an R such that this is positive, this quantity is positive. And uh, since, since we have the upper term solution, the let's say the limit uh, singular solution, which is the unit disk, then applying the implicit function theorem for uh, in Banach spaces uh, for, this, uh, for this operator, you get that if, if epsilon is small enough, you have solutions to the um, to the equation g epsilon b equal to zero, and uh, and this this is related to the to the Neumann condition, to the Neumann problem, and defining the the things defining uh, going back in the process you, you define psi as epsilon square phi the function that you obtained uh, here with this solution this this constant you define this way you you define several constants etc you get the solution to your overdetermined boundary problem. And you can check actually, for example, uh, there, there was a square root here and there is some sign, so maybe it's not clear if it's positive. You can check to, that, that actually this is a, this is a positive uh, this is a positive function here, which is inside, uh, because psi is negative, if r is positive, etc. So everything is, is well defined and it's actually it's a smooth of CS up to the boundary. Okay, so we are almost done. Just two, two final remarks is that the construction, as I said uh, at the beginning, is, is flexible. You, you can make other choices of your function f tilde and h. For example, here you can consider a function f tilde that is quadratic in psi uh, before it was linear because we assume f prime, f tilde prime to be not zero. Not zero. And this method actually. It can, can be used to solve other overdetermined problems, not, not necessarily arising in, in this situation of Grazia Frano, but overdetermined problems uh, of this type, uh, linear uh, problems, uh, sorry, uh, semi linear elliptic problems in both the domains with some with Dirichlet and Neumann data, which are not necessarily constant. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is essentially the same. So I think I'm done. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your attention.